Okay, let's complete the materials for week four of building scalable distributed systems by looking at some more distributed systems fundamental issues. These are inherent in any distributed system that we build, so they're really important that you understand their implications. So the first issue we're going to discuss has to do with... So as we know, distributed systems communicate over a network. In communications terminology, the shared local and wide area networks that our systems communicate over are known as asynchronous networks. With an asynchronous network, nodes can choose to send data to other nodes at any time. The network is half duplex, such that one node sends a request and must wait for a response from the other. These are two separate communications. The time for data to be communicated between nodes is variable due to reasons like network congestion and transient network connection failures. The receiving node may or may not be available due to a machine crash. Data can be lost. In wireless networks, packets can be corrupted and hence dropped due to weak signals or interference. Internet routers are allowed to drop packets during congestion. And nodes do not have identical internal clocks and hence are not synchronized. So what does all this mean for our applications? Well, put simply, when a client sends a request to a server, how long does it wait until it receives a reply? If it's a long time, is it just the server being slow? Or is the network congested and the packet has been dropped? If the client does get, doesn't get a reply in an, the expected time frame, what should it do? Let's explore these scenarios in details. The core problem is known as handling partial failures, and the general, general scenario is depicted on this slide. So when the client sends a request and expects a response from the server, the following outcomes can all occur. First, the request succeeds and a rapid response is received. This is great, this is what we love. Second, the destination IP address lookup may fail. In this case, the client rapidly receives an error message. So rapid, rapid error messages are good. At least you know what the situation is. Number three, the IP address is valid, but the destination node or target server process has failed. So again, the, the client will receive an error message. The protocol will recognize that the server's not available or the node has crashed and res respond accordingly. Number four, this is where life gets a little bit trickier. The request is received by the target server, but while it's processing the request, it fails. The software crashes and no response is ever sent, so the client will never get a response. Number five, the request is received by the target server, but the target server is really busy and it processes the request, but slowly. You know, it takes multiple seconds to respond instead of the expected 100 milliseconds. So what does this client do? Number six, the request is received by the target server and a response is sent, but response is not received by the client due to maybe it's dropped due to congestion by a router. So numbers one to three are really easy for the client to handle as a response is received rapidly. A result from the server or an error message either allows the client to proceed. It knows the situation. Failures that can be detected quickly are easy to deal with. Numbers four to six pose a problem for the client. He has no insight into the reason why a response has not been received. From a client's perspective, these three outcomes look identical. They look exactly the same. It cannot know, without waiting forever, whether res the response will arrive eventually or never arrive. And waiting forever doesn't get much work done. More insidiously, the client cannot know if the operation succeeded and the server or network failure caused the result to never arrive, or if the request is on its way, just simply delayed due to network congestion. These faults are collectively known as crash faults. The typical solution that clients adopt to handle crash faults is to resend the request after a configured timeout period. This, however, for some requests is fraught with danger, as you see on this slide. The client sends a request to the server to deposit money in a bank account. 
When it receives no response after a timeout period, it resends the request. That begs the question, what is the resulting balance? The server may have applied the deposit, and it may not, depending on the partial failure scenario, as we discussed on the previous slide. The chance that the deposit may occur twice is great for the customer. You get double the money. The bank, though, is unlikely to be as amused by this possibility. We need a way to ensure in our server operations that retried duplicate requests from clients only results in the request being applied once. This is necessary to maintain correct application semantics. The property that we're trying to achieve here is known as idempotence. Idempotent operations can be applied multiple times without changing the result beyond the initial application. This means that for the example on our slide, the client can retry the request, request as many times as it likes, but the account will only ever be increased by $100. Requests that make no persistent state changes are naturally idempotent. This means all read requests, for example, are inherently safe as they make no changes to the underlying state of the application and no extra work is needed in the server. Updates, though, are a different matter. The system needs to devise a mechanism such that duplicate client requests can be detected by the server and they do not cause any state changes beyond the initial application. In API terms, these endpoints cause mutation of the server state and must be idempotent. The general approach to building idempotent operations is as follows. Clients include an idempotence key in all requests that mutate state. The key identifies a single operation from a specific client or event source. It's usually a composite of a user identifier, such as the session key, and a unique value, such as a local timestamp, a UUID, or a sequence number. When the server receives a request, it checks to see if it has previously seen the idempotence key by reading from a database that's uniquely designed for implementing idempotence. If the key is not in the database, this is a new request. The server then performs the business logic to update the application state. It also stores the idempotence key in a database to indicate that the operation has been successfully applied. If the idempotence key is in the database, this indicates that this request is a retry and the client a retry from the client and hence should not be processed. In this case, the server returns the valid results for the operation so that hopefully the client won't try again. The database used to store idempotence keys can be implemented in several ways. For example, as a separate database table or collection in the transactional database used for the application data, or it can be a dedicated database that provides very low latency lookups, such as a simple key value store. Unlike application data, idempotence keys don't have to be retained forever. Once a client receives an acknowledgement of success for an individual operation, the idempotence key can basically be discarded. It's no longer needed. The operation has succeeded. The simplest way to achieve this is to remove idempotence keys from the store after a specific time period, such as 60 minutes or 24 hours, and the time period depends totally on the application needs and the request volumes it's receiving. In addition, an idempotent API implementation must ensure that the application state is modified and the idempotence key is stored. Both must occur for success. If the application state is modified and due to some failure, the idempotence key is not stored, then a retry will cause the operation to be applied twice because the idempotence key is not stored and the client, the server will not see it when it looks it up. If the idempotence key is stored, but for some reason the application state is not modified, then the operation has not been applied. When a retry occurs, it will be filtered out as a duplicate as the idempotence key already exists and the update will be lost. The implication here is that the updates to the application state and idempotence key store must both occur or neither must occur. If you know your databases, you'll recognize this as a requirement for transactional semantics. Transactional semantics will ensure exactly once semantics for our operations, which guarantees that all messages will be always processed exactly once, exactly what we need for idempotence. 
Exactly once does not mean there will be no message transmission failures, no retries, and no application crashes. These are all inevitable. The most important thing is that the retries eventually succeed and the result is always the same. We'll return to the issue of communication delivery guarantees in later sections. But as the slide illustrates, there's a spectrum of semantics, each with different guarantees and performance implications. At most, once delivery is fast and unreliable. This is what the UDP protocol provides us with. At least once delivery is the guarantee provided by the TCP IP protocol, meaning duplicates are inevitable. Exactly once delivery, as we've discussed here, requires guarding against duplicates and hence trades off reliability against slower performance. As we'll see, some advanced communication mechanisms can provide our applications with exactly one semantics for free, requiring us to do no extra work. However, these don't operate at internet scale because of the performance implications. This is why our applications, are, because our applications are built on the at least one semantics of TCP IP, we must implement exactly one semantics in our APIs that cause mutation. Crash faults have other implications for the way we build distributed systems, and the one we'll discuss in this section is to do with distributed consensus. The general problem is nicely illustrated by the two generals problem, which you can get a good overview from by watching this video, or I will describe on the next slide. Imagine a city under siege by two armies. The armies lie on opposite sides of the city, and the terrain surrounding the city is difficult to travel through and visible to snipers from the city. In order to overwhelm the city, it's crucial that both armies attack at exactly the same time. This will stretch the city's defences and make victory much more likely for the attackers. If only one of the armies attacks, then they will likely be repelled. The question is, how can the two generals reach agreement or consensus on the exact time to attack, such that both generals know for certain that the agreement has been reached? They both need certainty that the other army will attack at the agreed time, otherwise there will be a disaster. To coordinate attack an attack, the first general sends a messenger to the other, with instructions to attack at a specific time. As the messenger may be captured or killed by snipers, the sending general cannot be certain the message has arrived, unless they get an acknowledgement messenger from the second general. Of course, the acknowledgement messenger may also be captured or killed, so even if the original messenger does get through, the first general may never know. And even if the acknowledgement message arrives, how does the second general know this? Unless they get an acknowledgement from the first general of the acknowledgement. Hopefully the problem is apparent. With messengers being randomly captured or extinguished, there's no guarantee the two generals will ever reach consensus on the attack time. In fact, it can be proven that this is not possible to guarantee agreement. There are solutions that increase the likelihood of reaching consensus. For example, you may go Game of Thrones style, and each general may send a hundred different messengers each time, thus increasing the probability that at least one will make the perilous journey to the other friendly army and successfully deliver the message. This two generals problem is analogous to two nodes in a distributed system wishing to reach agreement on some state, such as the value of a data item that can be updated at either. Partial failures are analogous to losing messages and acknowledgements. Messages may be lost or delayed for an indeterminate period of time. In fact, it can be demonstrated that consensus on an asynchronous network in the presence of crash faults, where messages can be delayed but not lost, is impossible to achieve within bounded time. This is known as the FLP impossibility theorem. Luckily, this is only a theoretical limitation. It demonstrates it's not possible to guarantee consensus will be reached with unbounded message delays on an asynchronous network. In reality, distributed systems reach consensus all the time. This is possible because while our networks are asynchronous, we can establish sensible practical bounds on message delays and retry after timeout periods. FLP is therefore a worst case scenario. Later in this course, we'll see several algorithms for establishing consensus when we discuss distributed databases. 
We should also note the issue of Byzantine failures. Imagine extending the two generals problem to having n generals who all need to agree on the time of attack. Also, imagine in this scenario there are traitorous messengers who may change the value of the time of the attack, or traitorous generals who may send false information to other generals. This class of malicious failures are known as Byzantine faults, and are particularly sinister in distributed systems. Luckily, the systems we discuss in this course typically live behind well-protected, secure enterprise networks and administrative environments. This means we can practically exclude handling Byzantine faults. Algorithms that do address malicious behavior exist, and if you're interested in practical applications, take a look at blockchain technologies and Bitcoin. Finally, let's move on to the final topic in this week's materials. And that topic is the topic of... Every node in a distributed system has its own internal clock. If all the clocks on every machine were perfectly synchronized, we could always simply compare the timestamps of events to determine the precise order they occur in. If this were reality, many of the problems we'll discuss with distributed systems would pretty much go away. Unfortunately, this is not the case. Clocks on individual nodes drift due to environmental conditions like changes in temperature or voltage. The amount of drift varies on every machine, but values like 10 to 20 seconds a day are not uncommon. Or with my current coffee machine, about 15 minutes a day. If left unchecked, the clock drift would render the time on a node meaningless, like my coffee machine if I don't correct it every few days. To address this problem, a number of time services exist. A time service represents an accurate time source, such as a GPS or an atomic clock, which can be used to reset the clock on a node to correct for the drift on a packet-switched variable latency data network. The most widely used time service is NTP, which provides a hierarchically organized collection of time servers spanning the globe. The root servers, of which there are about 300 worldwide, are the most accurate. Time servers in the next level of the hierarchy, where there's about 20,000, synchronize to within a few milliseconds of the root servers periodically, and so on throughout the hierarchy. And there's a maximum of 15 levels within the hierarchy. Globally, there are more than 175,000 NTP servers available for us to synchronize to. Using the NTP protocol, a node in an application running the NTP client can synchronize to an NTP server. The time on the node is set by UDP message exchanges with one or more NTP servers. Messages are timestamped and throughout the message exchange, the time taken for transit is estimated. This becomes a factor in the algorithm used by NTP to establish what the time on the client should be reset to. A simple NTP configuration was shown on the previous slide. On a LAN, machines can synchronize to an NTP server within a very small number of milliseconds accuracy. One interesting effect of NTP synchronization for our applications is that resetting of the clock can move the local node time forwards or backwards. This means that if our application is measuring the time taken for events to occur, e.g. to calculate latencies, it's possible that the end time of the event may be earlier than the start time if the NTP protocol has set the local time backwards. In fact, every node has two clocks. These are the time of day clock and the monotonic clock. The time of day clock represents the number of milliseconds since midnight January 1970. And in Java, you can get the current time of the time of day clock using the system.currentTimeMillis system call. This is a clock that can be reset by NTP and hence may jump forwards or backwards if it's a long way ahead or behind NTP time. Monoto the monotonic clock represents the amount of time in seconds and nanoseconds since an unspecified point in the past. This is typically the time of the last boot of the system. It will only ever move forward, however again it may not be a totally accurate measure of elapsed time because it can be stalled during a virtual machine suspension.
In Java, you can get the current monotonic clock time using the system.nano time call. Applications use NTP to ensure the clocks on every node in the system are closely synchronized. And we'll see real practical examples of why this is useful when we discuss distributed databases. It's typical for an application to resynchronize clocks on anything from a one hour to a one day time interval. This ensures the clocks remain close-ish in value. Still, if an application really needs to precisely know the order of events that can occur on different nodes, clock drift is going to make this fraught with danger. There are other time services that provide higher accuracy than NTP. Crony supports the NTP protocol, but provides much higher accuracy and greater scalability than NTP. This is the reason it's recently been adopted by Facebook. Amazon has built the Amazon Time Sync service, and this has been achieved by installing GPS and atomic clocks in its data centers. And this service is available for free to all Amazon Cloud customers. The takeaway from this discussion is that our applications cannot rely on timestamps of events on different nodes to represent the actual order of these events. Clock drift, even by a second or two, makes cross-node timestamps comparisons meaningless. The implication of this will be clear when we discuss distributed databases in detail. We've covered a lot of ground in this section to explain some of the foundational issues of communication and time in distributed systems. The key issues that should resonate with you and take you take away from this module are listed on the slide here. They're to do with the diversity of communications that our applications must utilize and their different performance and reliability characteristics. The fact that we get very variable latencies across these shared wide area networks. The messages we send can fail, but we have protocols that try to um, cover for these failures and make our messaging reliable. We also have remote method invocation and remote procedure call technologies built on top of these reliable protocols. And these provide abstractions for client server communication that mirror, mirror local calls. Consensus is a tricky thing in distributed systems because of the partial failures that um, applications experience. But in reality, we can devise a consensus algorithms, which we'll discuss later. And finally, clocks and individual nodes basically cannot be reliably compared. So we need to think about algorithms that enable us to make um, comparisons of, of the order of events across different nodes. And these issues will pervade the discussions in the rest of this course.